Hey everyone, this is another Wolfram Institute live science stream. Today we're continuing our discussion with Carlos um, about what we've been calling subaxiomatic foundations of mathematics, though I do suspect that with time this title will be revised as the very premise of the project becomes dissolved by the findings and the, in the actual theory building that, that we do, which is perfectly fine. That means the research is coming along well if you realize that the, the framing in which you originally couched the project turns out to be uh, actually somewhat misguided or naive with time. Now, when I say misguided, naive, the basic point that we're finding is that, yes, you can use lower level computation to emulate you know, some arbitrary axiomatization that you have, say, of, of Boolean algebra. But does it really mean that this is sub? I mean, the sub prefix, in some sense, you know, presupposes that it's more fundamental in some way. And I think that what we're going to find with this complexity categorical treatment, especially if we can start to under, understand these trade-offs between these different complexity measures. When I say that there's no free lunch in complexity, I suppose what I mean is, in some sense, there's no there's no such thing as being sub um, anything when you when you're doing sub. When you're when you're when you're talking about subaxiomatic, it's sub perhaps according to one measure, which is that maybe the actual rule is is uh, specified more parsimoniously. But if the actual computation is much more elaborate, in some sense it's just a counting trick, where you basically pass the complexity from from one measure to another, and you you can try and hide the complexity in one way or another. But if you take a a comprehensive view, you'll find that complexity somewhere. And so this supposes. Or, or, or suggests that, yeah, it, su it suggests uh, that, yeah, that, um, that <clears throat> yes, you, you can identify this strong relationship between mathematics and computation. You can continue to compile mathematics down to these lower and lower, lower uh, fundam uh, uh, formal systems until it basically just looks like computation. And you could say, ah, mathematics is really just computation. But if we find that really, this is just a particular choice within this greater formal object that we're going to define has these different morphisms where you're exchanging um, and trading these different complexity measures, then, um, well, the, the implications will be interesting. It'll suggest mathematics and computation are really not that distinct from one another. It just depends where you want to allocate your, your complexity. Do you want it in the form of rules? Do you want it in the form of computation? Anyway, that's a high-level introduction for people who uh, may or may not have been following this before, and for people who are interested in understanding what was that initial motivation that inspired the title, and why we may uh, very well change the title. Like when we have a, an institute report, and when we actually publish papers on this, it's not going to be called sub axiomatic Foundation. At some point, we're going to have to change the name, come up with a better name. Anyway, right. I know that Carlos has been meeting with some of the fellows, Nick, uh, Etc. He has some things to show. Carlos, I won't, uh, I won't uh, stop you. Please go ahead. Let's talk about what you've been doing. Yeah. So uh, to uh, update some of our viewers in case they um, they didn't follow the last couple of streams. So indeed, we've moved from this point of view of let's look at these very specific formal systems uh, and and let's look at the and also to update Richard, who's who's here now. Um, we, uh, we, we've moved from just looking at these specific formal systems and, and uh, finding this idea of emulation, which I thought was very interesting, and that's how we got started in this uh, writing by Stephen and the SK Computer. It's very, very exciting. But we, <clears throat> as, as James just summarized, we've um, moved into thinking more about in terms of, okay, so there, there are choices that we can make in the landscape of possible axiomatic systems or possible choices of rewrite rules, and we want to have... Uh, a more systematic way of navigating it, right? Instead of just saying, let's just experiment, see what happens, look at big graphs of, of things, uh, let's have some kind of more more systematic control. So one, yes. my suggestion, my preliminary suggestion to this was, uh, some viewers might remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the idea that uh, it's basically an observation that gets turned into a pretty serious, uh, possibly, possibly very serious endeavor, uh, which is the idea that all these formal systems can be uh, encoded in, in the form of hypergraphs. And, and of course, it's very natural that we, we are in the context of the Wolfram sphere because we, we have a lot of functionality for hypergraphs, but perhaps not enough. And, and the point is um, that being able to uh, in basically express all these uh, terms in, in many different, um, very different rewrite systems as hypergraphs allows you to somehow centralize the discussion of complexity and, and the metrics and, and so on quite, uh, quite uh, succinctly. Um, and it kind of boils down the, the question of how do you assign 
uh, complexity measures or uh, size measures or, or things like that, uh, metrics in general, um, to, to your terms in different contexts to how do you assign such metrics to hypergraphs and, and, and just, uh, and I thought, and this is what we were discussing with uh, Nick and I mostly and a bit with Richard as well, um, how we should take some time to, to just think about what it means to, to take measures from metrics uh, from uh, from hypergraphs because then it should be fairly straightforward that uh, that that once we have the actual rewrite system we have all the time complexity that is going to be its own topic but at least uh, you know one thing at a time kind of thing let's let's think about uh, I suggest that we spend some time of this meeting uh, uh, just discussing uh, possibilities of uh, complexity of hypergraphs so I'll share uh, some preliminary list that we came up with, um, and so James can can glance at it, and we can we can all um, riff on on the possibilities. <clears throat> um, okay, can you all see this? Yep. <clears throat> okay, so let me see if actually that worked on the stream because the the stream did something weird. That, that's working fine. So, <clears throat> so yeah. So, so uh, some kind of uh, I was trying to blame the, you know, hypergraph in mean, the physics roadmap. So, some kind of hypergraph roadmap. The one thing that's relevant. I mean, there's many things that, that we've discussed at some points. That you know, talking about rewrite rules and talking about hypergraphs as, as data structures and so on. But what concerns us uh, with with James' uh, suggestion of of having complexity of some of some kind enter the the the, the formal. Uh, the formalization of this of this theoretical framework is on the yeah. on, on the hypergraph metrics, right? So um, there's some very simple things that you can do with a hypergraph. You can look at you know cardinality of the sets involved. So vertex set uh, to me this has very low priority because vertices are kind of like the support of the hypergraph, not really the data of the hypergraph. Uh, I say yeah. this because you can have vertex like data just as one edges, right? Like uh, order one edges. So um, Vertices are not that, that important in that sense. But then definitely edge set cardinality. And this is a cardinality that, I say, as I say in the second point, is, is graded by order, right? And this is what I, what I call the rank and, and co-rank of a, of a hypergraph. What I call the rank is the maximum order of, of, a, of a hyper edge that occurs in a, in a hypergraph, right? And the core rank is the minimum. Um, so, okay, okay. So, so, these, so, so cardinality of the edge set, it could be just, you know, the whole thing, as many edges as you have, that's your cardinality, but it, it also has this internal graded structure that you go from one edges, two edges, three edges, and so on. And by the way, uh, just for, especially for viewers, if you want to have a picture of a hypergraph in mind, think simple and directed hypergraph. Like we're, we're doing really the most basic uh, instance of a hypergraph. Um, and so then you go into more of like non-single number metrics. So things that have to do more with kind of network theoretic considerations like um, distributions of cardinality of order, a bit, a bit like the grading, uh, connectivity, centrality, all these kinds of network theoretic concepts, then, you know, you can always average them or something like that, and you, you can get a single number metric if you want. Um, and then, of course, there's the entire physics project uh, kind of approach, which regards hypergraphs as discrete spaces, right? Some kind of discrete geometry, right? So you can have um, uh, notions of dimensionality, notions of curvature, and then if we really want to get fancy, we could always bring in some physical concepts like, you know, density or mass or whatever, you know, from, from the physics project. And then uh, basically uh, there is, so this, this, this set of, 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 I would say this four edge cardinality and then this uh, network like uh, metrics and kind of ge discrete geometry metrics or well from physics uh, metrics. I think these are the three classes of metrics that, that are very reasonable to actually use in practice and they're kind of ready to code uh, immediately. But then there's a few more sophisticated things that we can do, which is basically, you know, hypergraph is a very flexible data structure. We can do many things with them. So in particular, we can, for example, RET reduce or order reduce. I mean, I don't know how to call them, but doing reduction means, um, for example, if you have, imagine that you have a ternary hypergraph, meaning made of triangles of vertices, right? Mm -hmm. You can always, reduce it to a binary one with which you replace every single triangle mm -hmm. effectively by its uh, by its boundary right so you have all the binary relations that uh, uh, would be sort of like transitive in this ternary one 
So you, you, you forget about the, the, all the higher order data and you collapse it down to something that is just pairwise, right? You can always do this. And you can do this, in fact, with any order. So you can collapse any higher order hypergraph down to, you know, one edge, two edge, three edge kind of hypergraph, right? So if we reduce it to something like a graph, then we can do all graph theory metrics that we, we have a lot of, you know, functionality in the language, for example, or, or there's a lot of literature on that. And then there's uh, the possibility of translate. So you always, another way of transforming a hypergraph into a graph is to do the incidence graph, which technically distinguishes um, vertices. There, there are two kinds of vertices. There's the edge vertex and there's the vertex vertex, so, so to speak. Um, but, they, but nonetheless, they are, they are graphs. They are conventional graphs. So again, you can apply whatever your favorite uh, graph theory, network theory, measures to that graph and and that will come uh, directly from the original hypergraph so that's another avenue and the last avenue uh it's perhaps one that sooner or later we will probably need to develop and uh, richard and, and nick have expressed a lot of interest in which is the um, the more computational side of hypergraphs uh from the from the point of view of quote unquote tensors the machine learning tensors uh which is the, this hyper matrix uh, encoding so it's basically the idea that you know uh, everyone knows that a graph can be encoded as an adjacency matrix, and it's basically, you know, if you have a simple undirected hypergraph, it's basically a Boolean matrix, right? So hypergraphs have this so-called hypermatrices uh, associated to them, um, and they are this higher order version of, of matrices. So doing this higher hyperlinear algebra on on this on these hypermatrices um, probably has, I mean. The, Buka suggested, for example, doing metric uh, matrix uh, measures like entropy or what, things like that. Those will be the kinds of objects on which you can define those measures. So this is kind of a summary of all the uh, all the metrics that you can you can do to a hypergraph. So I, I I thought that we could sort of discuss and see w what we think is more you know high priority and uh, I mean just check on what we think about this stuff because this will be in my view this mm -hmm. story is going to inform how we look at um, the, the, the um, algorithmic complexity, not the time complexity, right? Like the, the complexity, the sort of what I'm calling the static complexity in some sense, right? To distinguish it from the time evolution complexity. So Yes, okay. okay. So, so as I understand it from the last meeting, you had suggested, Carlos, that we can take a particular rule and we can actually um, show, formalize, uh, objectify that rule you know, in terms of hypergraphs. So we, ha we have a rule, take that, right? We actually express that rule in terms of hypergraphs themselves, and then we can perform some kind of measure on those hypergraphs. And that's going to give us some proxy for algorithmic complexity. This is the idea, right? Yeah, yeah. This, this is what we're trying to do. Well, yeah, yeah. So yeah. so, so I should say that this, this is a bit more general in, or, or it's more generic in the sense that it applies to hypergraphs just generically, but it so happens that yes. in our context, our states are going to be labeled hypergraphs for all the formal systems of interest and the rewrite rules are going to be hypergraph rewrite rules. So particularly the rewrite rules themselves are understood as trios of hypergraphs. I mean, intuitively yes. everyone understands that there's an input and an output, but we also need this device of a context hypergraph to know what we are preserving in the rewrite, right? So effectively just three three hypergraphs fully characterize a rewrite rule, right? So we can, I mean, if we know how to do complexity of a single hypergraph, it's obvious how to do complexity of a rewrite rule. Right. right. Well, well, so, so what, what I would suggest, suggest though is, okay, so <clears throat> we're going to <clears throat> represent our rules through these hypergraph triplets. What, what I would recommend doing is taking even these rules that we've been examining, where you can take other rules yep. and start actually representing them in terms of these triplets. And what I would recommend doing is especially start with a sample of a few rules where you know that one is kind of when you're eyeballing it or, or you're thinking about it intuitively, you know that one rule set is simpler than another rule set. It could be that there are, you, in one case you have, um, you have a rule with more arguments or there are more operators or you know, you fig figure out a case where the, it's obvious that one rule set is more complicated than the other. Actually start representing these things in terms of hypergraphs. And I mean, I encourage you to to try applying, you know, um, a, a few of these different measures. And I would try and determine it first experimentally, 
which ones appear to um, capture the difference between them uh, more saliently. Sure. And then w once you have some experimental guidance where the experimental the, the, the experiments help you to kind of um, discard some or uh, pay heightened attention to another, then try to develop an actual theoretical rationale for why one one measure you think is um, is better. I will say that I do very much like this idea of converting the hypergraphs themselves to matrices and performing you know something like a, a an entropy measure on, on those matrices. Yeah. that's it's interesting. So want, that's an I'll, example of something yeah. of something that intuitively sounds right. But what if it's the case that for whatever reason, because I do like to still you know um, I, I still like to retain some uncertainty and, and wait until this to wait to see what the experiment actually would suggest. I mean, it could be that this sounds interesting in principle, but then you take some rules that it's obviously more complicated than the other. And in that measure doesn't actually capture it. So that's the, the most prudent way I think to proceed is yes, proliferate as many of these measures as you, as you think, um, you know, you can easily compute, start actually getting some examples and let's see what the, the, the differences in the measures for these and whichever one seems to capture it um, best is is a, is, a, is a good candidate measure okay, of, so, of algorithmic complexity, I would yeah, say. Yeah, so, so and then a couple of questions then. So if, because, I, for example, I have some particular favorites for, if you give me a hypergraph, um, mm -hmm. Ed said cardinality is an obvious choice because it's kind of the size of the hypergraph, right? It, it gives you... It's, yes. it, it gives you a good, a good sense of the size of the hypergraph, right? In fact, that's what I normally call the size of a hypergraph. Yeah, okay, um, okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. like in a technical definition. So, so for example, I could just compare that or even uh, some um, order graded and, and, and central, uh, sorry, connectivity kind of, uh, because, you know, if you have a, you can have a very big hypergraph, there's just a, a lot of, a lot of like disjointed uh, sure. hyper edges. And it's sure it's big, yes. but it's not very, complex right so you can always yes, you can yes. always come up with you know something to do with connectivity and something to do with size and that i think is a good initial sort of guess for what what a you know intuitive. i agree so but those, my, those but, sound like good ideas yeah, yeah my, but then this there was a preface the question is um okay. having okay. something like that um how would you because the fact that rewrite rules are rules um we have this um input output i mean forget about the context for now i mean imagine that you just look at the input as a, which is a label hypergraph and the output, which is another label hypergraph. Um, do I just aggregate the metrics for both or do I consider like, I'm, I'm just throwing this question by the way, I'm not, I'm not saying this is something very minor. Sure. I'm, just, I'm just throwing the yeah, question, yeah. anyone who wants to chime in, please do. Um, like, do, do we just like, um, because it, it, it feels to me, we could do the obvious, which is just, okay, whatever, metric for input, metric for output, and because they are plus, you just add. Uh, but it feels like a rewrite rule is doing something that, I mean, that is not just, you know, if you're, how to say, it, like, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I know, I, I, this is an open question for me. Like, I don't know exactly, if I know exactly how to, Imagine that I figure out what is the best way to assign uh, complexity to a hypergraph or like some metric to a hypergraph. How do you how do you assign com complexity or or a similar kind of metric to a rewrite rule that depends on input output and some kind of this is what it's preserved between the two? What are your thoughts on? Maybe you should treat it as a, an exponential object because it's a fun, like a function, right? You have an output and input, and usually you, you raise output to your input as a power in order to to assign some complexity to it, right? So if you have complexity for an input hypergraph and complexity for output hypergraph, you just raise to the power and you have an exponential object. You mean the output and the, it, and then as and then the input is the is the expo is in the exponent? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you take identity rule and like, I don't know, you, you have two graphs with hi. But ident identity, you mean? So, Same okay. left and right hand side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so that's actually a good example. So, would you would you would you say that that's twice the metric of of the thing that's being preserved? 
Sounds wrong. Sounds, seems wrong. Sounds wrong, right? Well, you have to... It, it, this exponentiation makes sense when you have cardinalities, right? If you have a type, that's in type theory when you do it. If you have a function from type A from type B, then the cardinality of your function is B to the power of A. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? I, I, I agree. The, my, yeah, I my, 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 my issue, my issue is that rewrite rules are not like maps. Like I, that's one of the traps I think to fall into when thinking abstractly about rewrite rules. One might think because there's some kind of like input output that that you can think of them as maps. I don't think that's very accurate. Like it makes sense kind of intuitively in some sense, but like I don't think that's very accurate. Um, that they are like maps because they, I mean, they, they induce. Well, no, if you have like left hand side, at least you can, you, you can enumerate how many. My, my point, my point okay, let, let me, let me make precise my, I made a very general point when I actually wanted to say something more concrete to your, to your suggestion. When you, ha when you have this rule of exponentiation in cardinalities, it's because you're mapping from sets to sets, right? Or at least originally yeah, yeah, yeah. inspired by. Yeah. That's that's not what's, what's happening when you're doing a rewrite. Right? You're not mapping anything to anything. Well, I, I agree. Just uh, maybe we can somehow modify this. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. But I see. I, at least you can, as an input, you know how to count all the possible hypergraphs that your input can match against, right? So it's like, like you have a type or a set, and when you have an output, you can do. Wait. wait say that again. I don't, I don't know thing. what you meant by that. Say that again. As an input yeah. on your rule, or yeah. your left hand side of your rule, you can just count the all possible. In a way, maybe it's infinite. It depends how you limit your variables and how many vertices you matched against. But if you're given a hypergraph and this rule, you can count how many possible subgraphs this left hand side can match. Ah, but I think so we were thinking so of something like a else. I think we we're simply. We're... I see what you mean now, but uh, I think we were thinking of another direction, which was that we want to take the rule in isolation, like regardless of context, because then you might want to specify your domain, like your initial states or preferred states or whatever. But mm -hmm. if you take the rule in isolation, uh, we are saying yeah. if we have a way to us to assign a metric to each of the hypergraphs. Then... But it's, you, you can also count in, in isolation, right? As soon as you const constrain your variables, vertex variables. Sure, sure, I, I, I agree, yeah, I agree, yeah. But one thing, I'm... Thinking about this conceptually, you know, before I, I had discussed in highly informal terms, algorithmic complexity as an endowment in the rule set of an ability to perform computational work. So let's say you take the identity, the rule as an example, right? That rule, does that rule give you the ability, you know, given you're at some stage in your computation to perform non-trivial computational work? No. No, you don't get anywhere with that with that identity rule. You're exactly where you were uh, before. So, you know, I might make, you know, we were, we, you asked, the, you posed the question, Carlos, whether or not, for instance, you should, you know, we apply some complexity measure to the input and the output, and then we sum them, for instance, right? If you wanted to, we're just thinking hypothetically, right? If you wanted to ask, you know, to what degree does this rule in, uh, endow you with the ability to perform non-trivial computational work, you know, it could be that there's something where you're actually taking, it might be absolute valued, some sort of a difference between the two of them, where at least under that kind of a treatment, the identity rule would, would, would give you very low capacity to perform new computational work yeah, because yeah, your, your, input, your input and your output are basically the same. Now, it could be, on, you know, on, on, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just want to make one point, which is like, you can, ha you can imagine rules where given some really simple input, you get some very elaborate output. Like you, in the string rewriting case, it could be like A goes to, you know, A, B, 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 A, B, B. You know, that, that's quite a leap that you get just in the rule. It would take a long time with a simple rule to be able to go from A to A. Blah, 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 blah. Likewise, if you had a complicated left-hand side and it was A blah, 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 goes to A, you know, if you had a simpler rule, it would take a longer time to get there. So maybe some absolute value difference between these could um, tell you, you know, what kind of a leap you're able to do just just based on this rule alone. Richard, yep. please go, go, go I, ahead. I think yeah. I think you're exactly right, and I think it has to do with entropic gradient. And what I mean by that is that if we look at it again from like an inf information theoretic perspective, 
which is what we're trying to do. Um, yeah. And by the way, when we mentioned, say, Kal Magorov, that's really very much to do with the shortest program necessary to represent something, like a string. But we have notions like the von Neumann entropy, Shannon entropy, and so forth. So uh, Wukash's example of the identity is it's, it's in- introducing like no entropy gradient, whereas some rules may discard information, some rules may introduce new information into the system. And yeah. as you say, this identity rule causes no dynamics, introduces right. no dynamics, and leaves us with a static universe. Some rules may throw information away. Some rules may inject entropy into the system, which we need, because we need that energy in order to kind of uh, bring life into our computations. To, we, we, need, we need that information to, yeah, yeah, to sort of stimulate the system. Uh, so anyway, I found a reference. It's quite nice, and I think it, I think it's useful here. And it's because in the in the hypergra or sorry hy- hypermatrix uh, perspective, we're dealing with uniform hypergraphs, and not all of our hypergraphs are, are uniform. And so this paper I'm about to link. Um, Richard, with, can you can you briefly yeah. define your sense of uniformness? Because this varies a lot. What, what is right? Okay, I guess I was referring to like yeah, like K uniform. So like the the, the edge cardinality is uh, fixed for the the, the, the okay. entire so, graph. So 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 if we have like only three edges, then we we, we use a you know a, a, a n a n by n by n uh, hypermatrix. Yeah. But you know your hypergraph may contain two edges, three edges. 10 edge you know so then you have like a set of hypermatrix so 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 using like a so to come up with a general approach is is, is a bit tricky and and so some uh some attempts it, it, this paper makes reference to the ihara zeta function and, and you can use that as a method of uh calculating some complexity measures on a on a given really? hypergraph but uh, uh but but <laughs> Sorry, this one here is actually very interesting because it, it actually relates to what we were mentioning in the previous talk about the transfer operator, it's something called the Peron Frobenius operator. So they take the. So anyway, I'm going to paste it, and you guys should take a will, look. Will you do us a, do us a favor, Richard? If you just paste them in the Zoom chat, we'll see them, but 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 no one on Twitch or YouTube will yeah. see. Them. I will. I will. I, will, I, will, I, will I, I repost them. them I repost them to Twitch. Don't worry. Oh, you cool. do. Thank you. Okay. Thank great. you. Thank you. So my my interest in this one, if I just pull it back up myself, is that they what they do is they decompose the hypergraph into so uh, they've called this depth based complexity, and what they do uh-huh. is they take like so just at a, at a sort of quick overview is they sort of take the line hypergraph. And then, then they use these spectral methods. So they take like the Shannon entropy of the eigenvalues of these uh, uh, of the graph Laplacian of of these line graphs. So they take the they take the hypergraph, they compute the line graph, which which which, which now puts us in the in the sort of graph regime. Then then they yeah. apply these sp- spectral methods on those in order to get some kind of information theoretic complexity measure. So I mean, and and yeah, they make reference to some of these simple, simpler metrics like the edge cardinality and so forth. They're talking about distributions and centroids and whatever the variances and so forth. I I think this is a nice paper because it's it it, it performs like a kind of uh, an overview, like a kind of meta analysis of du- different techniques. But but what I find interesting is that they they make reference to this. Heron Frobenius operator, which I'd never encountered, but in in the previous uh, live stream we were talking about fractional iteration, and if you know you can jump from the fractional iteration pa- wiki page to the transfer operator page, and the transfer operator page talks about this Heron Frobenius operator. So there's there's a connection between what we're talking about now and 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 what we were talking about before with the the dynamic. The, the fractional dynamics and continuous time dynamics. So, but but yeah, it, what you were saying about the left and right hand sides and about comparing them, I, I think is to do with like a how the rule induces a kind of entropic gradient into the system. But that's just a hypothesis or an idea. As I think I'll... about it, I I'm somewhat doubtful that we will produce one indisputably superior measure for these right these are these are all these are proxies you know let's say we, let's think about the ultimate 
uh, deliverable for this project, some sort of final paper. You know, you can imagine we have some categorical setup and we're attaching these complexity measures to our arrows. And you can say, okay, and then, you know, you can obtain uh, values for these measures through a number of these different um, measures that we define and we can compare them. I mean, again, this, this is why I think it's a good idea to start um, taking some, some actual examples and we'll have to decide in terms of int intellectual integrity, which ones to choose. We'll probably find some measures that give highly pronounced accentuated differences between these. We'll find ones that are more subtle. Maybe they're, they're ones that look good uh, originally, and then we try them in a larger sample and they don't perform as well. We'll have to find ones that um, empirically uh, seem to give non-trivial results, that they actually capture the differences that we're looking for. But then we'll also need to theoretically and mathematically um, kind of confirm that these are not just kind of cheap measures that we're happening to include just because they happen to, to, to confirm our, our hypotheses. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's the first step. You, you've listed many of these. Richard has suggested other ones. Yes, these can get quite complicated. I mean, this is in part what Wukash and I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are like these assembly lines where, you know, you take something and then we'll take a, you, know, you take some group structure over it and you do this, you do that, you, you apply, you know, this, uh, you apply this transform to it, you, you look at its eigenvalue. I mean, yes, you, we can, you can build a whole, you know, uh, assembly line for taking some input and, and grinding and grinding and grinding and, get, and getting some sort of output. It's not clear to me how elaborate, you know, the, the treatment should be where we're taking these hypergraphs and applying, you know, more yeah. and more mathematical methods in order to extract it. Now, if someone has a strong theoretical thesis, you know, it's absolutely necessary to take these eigenvalues and to do this and to do that in order to extract some sort of essence. I'm always willing to entertain those arguments. But I think yeah. really the first the first thing is because we, we need this anyway, is Carlos has this idea, which seems which, which, which seems nice, which is let's treat rules as these hypergraph triplets. So let's get those triplets, let's get them for some rules where it's obvious that one rule is simpler than the other. Let's throw some of these measures at them. Let's get some statistics, let's visualize them, you know, take these different measures. We, we can compare them for, you know, for um, some sample of rules according to the different measures, you know, find ones that are accentuated that seem to, to capture the differences between them. And then among the ones that seem to perform well experimentally, ones that you think on, a, on an intellectual basis, on a rational mathematical basis, also seem to make sense and, and aren't just capturing some, you know, arbitrary aspect of the hypergraph that happens to be convenient for our purposes. So yeah, that, that's what I'd suggest. That, that sounds, yeah, that sounds reasonable. I found some, some extra references. Um, I put them on, on the, on the chat. So, cool. um, so yeah, uh, I think, you know, the, the intuitively this idea of some difference, between the two has to be quite careful and, and, and I'm quite interested. I think I mentioned this in the last stream and I don't think we can escape. Uh, I know I know that I keep bringing this up, uh, the relational sort of so being relational is, instead of being absolute, uh, which is something that I think is missing many, many times in computer science. Uh, but that might be my mm -hmm. ignorance. I don't want to judge. Um, so the fact I mean, I find it very hard to, from a, you, you mentioned intellectual integrity and, and being sort of like straight up. I find it very hard to accept from an intellectual point of view that an absolute measure of a hypergraph is that, that basically counts stuff, right? That just discretizes in some way, coarse, coarse grains in some way, and, and counts stuff. I find it very hard to believe that that's going to be the, the most meaningful uh, measure that we can assign to a hypergraph. I feel like what is inescapable when you think minimally about this is that you're going to have relational measures because this is really what it means to measure like physically right like from a physics sure. point of view you always compare you you, don't, you never assign absolute values to anything right? that doesn't make any sense so sure so what i think and actually this makes the problem of rule complexity a bit easier if we if mm -hmm. we have if we actually study and, and make and, and figure out a way to compare the complexity of two hypergraphs, two separate hypergraphs, with under some assumptions, of course. I mean, um, then that's exactly what a rewrite rule is, right? You compare the input to the output, and and it should you, you, our metrics will be the ones that you know, for example, the one that does absolutely nothing should be minimal or something, and then 
the one yeah. that, that there's nothing else because I was worried about so to illustrate my worry it's not just some abstract wish for relationality and, uh, and being more proper um, is that if you take just this ab the absolute value of difference or whatever <clears throat> you can uh, you can land into this situation where you have a rule that has the same size in, in both input output but actually it does a lot of stuff right it just so happens yeah. that it has the same size but it actually changes a, yeah. lot, of, a lot of internal structure so that would be yes. better like the identity, but it's nowhere near the identity, right? So anyway. It's so not the identity, right. Just to illustrate, right? So, um, well, so let me just say something about the about what you just said about the relational framework. So remember, and this is why, you know, I would say another thing to do in addition to this is to also specify this formal categorical framework, because ultimately we want to have these complexity measures assigned to, to morphisms in this category. So if, if these are going to be relative differences, that's good because that's ultimately what, what we want. And so it, it could yeah. be and it could be relative all the way down in the following sense. You know, let's say what we were just discussing is that even this algorithmic complexity measure might be a measure of the difference between these two input output hy uh, hypergraphs. And I guess also have to having to take the context into account. And I, I don't exactly understand how you would do that, but that's you also have to take that into account. But it's some relation between the input and the output. And then you're taking the relationship between this input and output and how it relates to some other input and output. And if you're basically passing between these rule rewrite pairs and you're saying, well, if you go from this rule to this rule, the relative you know, loss or gain in algorithmic complexity is blah, 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 blah. And the relative loss or gain in time complexity, which is easier to much, much easier to measure is, is blah, 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 then you're, you're giving information about what is gained and what is lost. I, I think that if you think about it in terms of th this is additional data that we're assigning to our morphisms, um, there's no, there's no reason for it to, for it to be, absolutely, it, it can always be relative. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. perfectly I mean, fine for it to be relative and relational. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see, for. we'll have to see how that pans out, like the attaching the morphism and so on, because the, I mean, in some sense, if we have to decide on a category of hypergraphs and probably some subcategories that we're going to work on, because this is just, I mean, even if we don't decide yes. on them, they are implicit. So might as, might as well just make it explicit and, and, and decide. Make it this. explicit, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so. Uh, put, that, put, put that on the to-do list. It, yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. We, we, we need to do that. Yeah. I, I've already done it, but in some sense, but okay. Um, do you have it, Carlos, do you have it written up in some document that I can see? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it, it's my notes. It's not like a document for someone else to read, but but yeah, this is. If you make okay, at least yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Make, make, preparing, yeah, preparing the, the readable version. Yes, or, or if you if you have it written up, uh, if it's if they're like handwritten or something, or or they're 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 typed but they're not they're not uh, other you know, allo readable. They're not read, read, readable by someone else. Just make, make those readable. I, I'm really excited to, to see those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but these, these things are not so much things that I'm inventing or developing. It's, it's more like the this there's this one paper um, that, that does, it's actually this this guy, Nicholas Baer, uh, that does um, yep. categorical mm -hmm. rewrite. Yeah, yeah so, so, so this guy is extremely good, but the papers are quite impenetrable. Um, so they're very difficult papers. And I do believe that I have 90% confidence that they understand this whole business of, of hypergraph rewrite quite well. Um, have you reached out? Have you reached out to him? Um, no, but I can. I, I see him every week at the graph uh, rewrite seminar. Yeah, I mean, if there's something in the paper that's quite, you know, thorny, no, we just ask him about it. No, no, I mean, uh, it's not. Well, it's not one thing. It's like the, the whole paper is very difficult. Like you have to study well, carefully. Well, th then you definitely should. Re you definitely should reach out to him. No, no, I mean, I'm yeah. studying it. I'm, I'm not saying, like, the paper is extremely well written. That's the thing. That I don't have questions about the, the actual content of the paper. I have, I, I, it's just difficult. Like, it's very, it's very heavy category theory, sort of, like, uh, formulated. And, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the... I mean, my friends who are experts on this think it's difficult. It's not just, like, my inexperience with it. So, so anyway, but my point is that um, choosing these categories, um, it's kind of inevitable. Like we, we'll make it explicit and I'm very happy to do that. But um, once we do that, this idea, so what a rewrite rule does, and this is kind of interesting, is not, it's not really like, it's not a morphism of hypergraphs. This is what I said before, that these are not maps, but it gives you, it, it gives you in itself 
uh, a link between between hypergraphs, right? So if this link is based on some kind of complexity measures or some kind of complexity compatibility, we can easily just define categories uh, from uh, from just the complexity, right? It's not that you at 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 sort of append some complexity measures to morphisms. It's more it's more basic than that, which I think is better. I mean, you 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 directly look at two hypergraphs and you say, yeah, you know, the 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 complexity morphism between these two is this one under this metrics that we've chosen. What there are many choices, of course, but um, because the problem with a like a morphism, a hypergraph morphism in most hypergraph categories are extremely rigid. Like you need a vertex map and you need a, a, a edge map that respects respects types and respects orders and whatnot. Like they are very rigid. They are good because you want them to be rigid to, for isomorphisms to be what you want, right? This is this is fine. Sure. But um, I would say that maps, uh, hyper, hyper, hypergraph morphisms um, are way too spe spe specific to really uh, say something about complexity. And we, we have, we probably have to just make complexity morphisms to be their own thing, right? Well, yes, I mean, part, another challenge is that we're studying, when we see emulation, there are two things that are, that are involved. On the one hand, you have different rules. And on, the other, on the other hand, you have different rewrite behavior. So before I had suggested that, kind of, you know, that we consider pairs of uh, constructors and, and the actual rewrite system, or you take the actual rules, and then you take the rewrite system that is, that is produced from some of the rules, maybe as pairs, because you want to know two kinds of complexity trade-offs. You want to know, is the rule becoming simpler or more complex? You want to know, is the actual execution of the rule becoming simpler or more complex? And so that's the challenge is formally, how can we define, you know, these emulations where we're passing between these pairs? We know it's pro possible in principle because we do it like that. The, the example of SK Combinator is an example of it. Yeah, yeah. We, need a ge we need a general framework in which we're describing, you're changing the rule and you're getting a different rewrite system. What it means to pass between these, you know, kind of morphisms as a, as a formalization of emulation that has these different complexity measures assigned to them. Yeah. But then, the then, then I definitely agree at that level, at the level of uh, rewrite systems, like the pair of states and, and rewrite rules. At that level, I completely agree that we need, we probably want to define something like a category that has yeah. more morphisms between them, for sure. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Yes. At that level, yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying we need morphisms on any lower, finer level. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, like hyper, like the rewrite itself, no. Yeah. But, but between, between these things, um, yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes well, sense. How are we doing on how are we doing on time? Well, we're about on time. We're um, yeah, we're we're doing quite fine on on time. Any um, okay, so let's review what we have in store. So, okay, so performing these experiments, taking some obvious rules, um, or sorry, taking some rules that that obviously differ in their other algorithmic complexity, actually getting the hypergraph uh, triplets for these and and performing some experiments where you take your your preferred metrics and you see how they how they play out and there and there are two things to consider one is actually applying them to each of the hypergraphs in your triplet and then understanding what you're going to do arithmetically with 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 these with these basic ones are you going to x are you going to exponentiate them are you going to take the absolute value of their difference yeah, yeah. I still recommend something you know like this gradient idea that that Richard was suggesting trying to understand I like this term leap, like, you know, because th this is what the computational rules really allow you to do is just to jump from one state to another one without doing the intermediate computations. So if you find some way of um, taking these measures that you have for each hypergraph in your triplet, I'm not, I still not, I still don't understand how the context plays in, um, that you'll have to figure that out, but how exactly you would code the way in which the rule allows you to perform these jumps that otherwise would take more more steps. Yeah. So getting some results, you know, you take some fixed sample of rules, you take the relative differences in these measures through a couple of different metrics. We look at them, for, and in advance, the ones that seem quite promising, you then subject to uh, more more careful mathematical scrutiny. Does this make sense mathematically? Does this really capture the essence of a hypergraph, or is it just some cheap example that happens to corroborate our results? And then also, um, 
that you have this note make hypergraph categories explicit. It's not really a, I mean, I guess in some sense we're doing this all in terms of hypergraphs, but it's more of a category of these rule rewrite system pairs. But but you understand what I, you understand the idea there. Um, and yeah, I mean the essence of this project, which I think now that we're gaining some momentum, I think can proceed more quickly. I mean there, there will always be. Um, uh, issues that are thornier than we than we expected, and, and I know there's a lot of literature to read. But the idea is basically we formalize these categories, we formalize the data that we're attaching to these morphisms, we experimentally um, propose, you know, we experimentally motivate the proposal of these various measures, and um, and then we show formally, you know, some particular examples, like the one that we have with. with a, you know, the thing we're calling Boolean algebra and SK combinators, we find some other examples and those can kind of motivate um, or or they can exemplify this this treatment that we have in mind. So this is the idea. In some way, this is going to intersect with the work that Richard is doing. But in the in the meantime, once we have this, we can write a nice institute report about it. And um, we can also take a, a yeah, one, one thing in general, I, I said this to, to Richard and, and to our student during another meeting, you know, we're, we're our own institute, and so we can very much decide when we have our own institute reports what kind of, you know, paper we want to write. We can, it can be long, it can be short, we can have a bunch of computational experiments, you know, we, we can do this however we want, we can have speculations. But then, for something like this, this itself could be turned into a, into a more straightforward academic paper as well. So I think find, find, finding a way to, to do both, we always have the option to do both. Um, th this, this in its own right sh should be some, some paper that um, we show to people who are interested in the intersection of, of computation and, and category theory, which is a growing community. This, this will be a nice thing to show to them. But we can also have our own version where you know, it's much more elaborate and we, and we include any details that we want. So this is coming along. Um, I, I tend to prefer... Um, to at some point kind of begin the phase where we start trying to produce these reports as a structured means for doing the research. This is about to happen with what's happening with Wukash. Um, I'm about to have a meeting on the physics roadmap. The roadmap's another good example. I mean, at some point, we're gonna kind of pivot from just the, like we're doing a combination, which is not bad, of performing experiments and discussing theory, which is good. And I've been pushing like from the very beginning, let's not just discuss theory, let's also do some real computations. At some point, Carlos, I would say like within the next maybe like maybe at most three weeks from now, I would say we should start actually working on kind of piecing this together into a report. We'll be doing the research as we're writing the report, but it'll provide a kind of a structured template for us to actually articulate our thoughts, start to actually make claims and, and interrogate whether or not they're they're sound assemble our results together and um, and then this will get closer to, uh, to coming together. Yeah, cool. Makes sense. All right, nice. guys. Well, yep, this has been good. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks, yep. everyone else for participating. And 